check litigation. I'm Mike Coffey, president of Imperative Information Group. We are a background screening company based in Fort Worth, Texas, but I am an HR guy. I've, that was my career before I started consulting um, probably 18, 19 years ago. And then 16 years ago, my or my consulting practice kind of turned into a background screening company uh, to assist one particular client. And now here we are 16 years later and um, background screening is what pays for all my kids' orthodontia. And my consulting is still the fun things that I get to do, spend time with clients solving problems primarily around um, their selection and onboarding and employee relations issues. Um, I have spent my whole career running away from comp and benefits uh, or any of that stuff. But I have spent a lot of time in the areas we're talking about certainly around background checks, helping clients uh, make sure they're compliant and sometimes helping new clients uh, dig themselves out of a ditch. Um, some of what you hear today is going to be strictly the law and it's going to be, you know, pretty obvious that this is a, uh, what the Fair Credit Reporting Act requires or something like that. But at other times, you're going to hear things that are basically my experience uh, working with clients, uh, looking for practical ways to, to do things that don't, you know, run the risk of putting you out of business. Um, because we all know that if we um, if we get, unless you've got just one of those great employment law attorneys who is really a practical business-minded person, you, you know, if you did everything they suggested that your employment law counsel or certainly that regulators like the EEOC and others would have you do, it would make it very difficult to actually remain in business. And so I've spent a lot of time working with clients to figure out how do we walk that line? Um, how do we make sure that we're compliant, that we're bulletproof as far as compliance goes, and that we're treating our applicants and employees uh, fairly and, 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 and we're acting pretty transparently in how we're doing our background check business, but also making sure that we have a safe and productive workforce. And so some of that opinion stuff is definitely gospel according to coffee. And what I would suggest there, if, if I suggest something at any point along the way that uh, is different than what your legal counsel has told you, I really would encourage you uh, to talk to them before you change any of your policies. Um, they may, they know certainly will know your organization better than I do, and there may be reasons you do what you do. Uh, maybe you've had a certain problem in the past, or maybe you've just got a certain subset of managers uh, someplace in your or organization that are just knuckleheads, and your employment law counsel says, this is just, you know, given uh, your environment, this is the best way to do it. So I do want you to go back and uh, talk to your legal counsel before you change any processes. And then if they have questions, and this happens quite often, uh, particularly with new clients, ha feel free to have them call me and we can talk about uh, their concerns and things like that. So I'm always glad to do that. So having said that, let's get started. The um, I'm having issues there, there we go. There are 65, between 65 and 70 million Americans with some sort of criminal history. Now, what does that really mean? Um, you know, that, that number gets thrown around and groups like the National Employment Law Project and other groups would have you believe that that means these people are unemployable, that no employer is going to hire them. And that's kind of the story that you hear in the media, uh, because quite honestly, uh, Sherm and other groups that are, um, you know, approaching the public on behalf of employers haven't done a good job of, of really getting the message out that there's a job for everybody out there. Oops. Looks like we were paused. I'm sorry. And uh, there's a job for everybody out there. And, uh, you know, it just means that not everybody's right for every job based on their past behavior. And certainly criminal history is part of that, but other behavior as well. They're employment history, what they've chosen to do for school and everything else is all indicative of, you know, how that person's going to perform in a certain role in your organization. So while, you know, there are, you know, a great number of uh, Americans with criminal records, my experience is that most employers are pretty reasonable about how they approach criminal history. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of those things, but 
I want to really suggest to you that the first step to avoiding litigation is really spending time looking at and documenting your entire screening process um, because some subset of these 65 million Americans with criminal records know plaintiff's attorneys and they are going to at some point challenge um, what you're doing and and the best thing you can do is, is document that hey we've thought through this process and these are these are the decisions we've made and, and here's the and here's the documentation that we went through you know to document what what our considerations were um, so the um, oh geez why is it doing that Oops. excuse me I mean a bad computer day okay so let's go on so your screening process is not the background check and I I can't stress that enough if you were in my know your hires webinar a couple weeks ago you'll know that I take this view that everything from the job description uh, through your interview process uh, is all a critical piece of your screening process and then the background check is just really the final piece uh, of that process and uh, that webinar from a couple weeks ago that really goes through that detail is on our website you also want to make sure that your background screening uh, process considers uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's concerns about the use of criminal history and, and possible violations of Title VII. So what, what that can mean is that because some individuals are more likely to have, uh, based on some, some uh, protected classes are more likely to have criminal history than the majority population, if your use of criminal history is overly broad and not thoughtful in, in considering the relevance to the position, how long ago the position was, things like that, um, then you may create a, a disparate impact against people in a protected class. And we have a whole webinar just on dealing with the EEOC's enforcement guidance regarding and Title VII uh, considerations that we'll be giving in a few weeks, and so you can certainly sign up for that. But you want to have that process documented uh, in order to make sure that you've thought through it and you've got the documentation you may have seen that bmw just settled a, a lawsuit for over a million dollars uh with the eeoc um and we'll be talking about that lawsuit certainly in that settlement uh in the uh in our in our webinar here in a few weeks one of the things you can do in making sure that you've documented your concerns or use the tools that that we provide our clients and i'd be glad to share with you uh if you'll attend that that EEOC webinar and the criminal history matrix webinar that we'll be giving after that uh, these tools really help you figure out for this particular position um, these are the kind of criminal offenses that we're concerned with based on their age and some positions are going to outright exclude you from consideration for this job uh, in this time period you know if you've got a DWI in the last three years we're well, not going to hire you for a driver for instance that may be your policy or if you've got a conviction in the last two years for uh, selling alcohol to a minor, we're not going to let you be a bartender in our in our in our restaurant, things like that. But then there are going to be other offenses that say, well, you say, well, you know, we're interested in that. We want all the details. That doesn't they don't in and of themselves create an automatic exclusion. But we want to understand the full context, and then we're going to compare that uh, that information to the rest of the applicant pool. And it's just going to be one more factor in evaluating you as an applicant against the other applicants uh, who, who are applying for that job. Then there may, may be some offenses that are because of their age and their, their lack of relationship to the job and, um, you know, and, and you know, the fact that they're relatively minor um, really have no impact on, on the hiring decision at all. And you say this, you know, you would decide that these offenses, you know, just would not affect an applicant's eligibility for employment. So we have a whole webinar coming up on, on creating crim, a criminal history evaluation tool, and um, I would encourage you to look at that too as, as you develop your, your, uh, your whole screening process and look at how you document that. And then, of course, your job application is really key. Asking the right questions on your employment application is uh, so important. And then making sure that 
that the questions, you know, that you tailor some of these questions for certain jobs. Certainly if you're a DOT covered employer, the uh, requirements for, for what's in your employment application um, would definitely uh, be affected by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations because there are certain things that have to be in a DOT driver's employment application that you wouldn't want, like a date of birth, that you normally don't have in a normal employment application. There may be specific things if you're if you've got some sort of accreditation uh, from some sort of uh, self-regulatory body, you want to make sure that your application meets their standards as well. And then you want to make sure you're getting information like education, uh, employment history, and it's really key in employment history to to get real details about what this person's role was. I see a lot of um, applications where they ask a title and ask reason for termination, but there's nothing else there. Um, I, I love an application that says, um, you know, gives an applicant an opportunity to, to share their successes. You know, uh, what, you know what, what, what were your successes in this role? Um, write there an application, have them write that down. Um, because that gives you great information to, to go back on during the interview and, and remember to follow up about. And it gives you, if you're calling the references yourself and doing your employment verifications, it gives you opportunity to have something to talk to that person about. And so, um, and it gives you some insight into things like, you know, can this employee, you know, can this applicant write? Can they put a subject and a verb and a sentence in a, with appropriate punctuation? And for some positions, that makes sense. You know, that's important. And why not have the applicant do that, you know, demonstrate that kind of skill right on the application? Um, you may decide that you want to look at their their credit history and how they've managed their financial history and things like that. And, and of course, uh, you know, you'll ask them about their criminal history. Um, and I, I really, we've got a whole webinar coming up on on, on asking uh, about criminal history. And uh, but I would suggest that you really want to do that um, unless you're in a state that has banned the box or even a municipality now that's banned the box and requires you to delay that inquiry until later, which uh, we do have a webinar, like I said, on, on the criminal history inquiries and ban the box laws that's coming up in a, in a couple months. And so you'll you want to make sure that you're compliant with that. But as soon as the process as you can, I, I still encourage employers to go ahead and ask the criminal history question and get it documented, get an answer, so that you're not wasting your time or the applicant's time if there's something that would just outright exclude them from employment. So that's, those are all things that you can have in your job application or at another point during the interview process, depending on the law where, you, uh, where you're operating. This is our standard criminal history inquiry. And like I said, there are some ban the box laws and they, they don't allow you to ask a criminal history inquiry you know, question on the employment application. Some of them require you to delay it until later in the process. Um, you know, either after the person's been selected for an interview or at an interview or after an interview. And in a few locations, including now New York City, um, you can't ask until after the applicant has been extended a conditional job offer. So you need to know what the rules are everywhere and then figure out from there how you, how, how your organization is going to comply with that. And certainly your background screening company should be able to help you figure some of that out as well. But that whole employment application is really the least expensive integrity test you'll ever give this applicant. So I would suggest that you want to make sure you're, um, you know, that you're making sure your applicants answer all of the questions on the application that they, um, that you don't accept an application either electronically or uh, in paper form that doesn't have a full uh, accounting of everything you asked for. Uh, there are certain questions, you know, uh, reason for termination or the, certainly the criminal history question where we see, we'll discuss. And I would suggest to you, no, we won't. That's, uh, that's not um, what, uh, you know, that's not why I'm asking this question. I'm asking the question because it's a legal question and I need an applicant to, to be honest with it. And this, that, that applicant who is writing, we'll discuss uh, on your legally posed questions on the employment application, is signaling to you that they're not going to—they're going to give you compliance issues later. This is somebody who doesn't want to follow your rules, and quite honestly, that's one of the prerequisites for for most employment is is following the employer's rules. 
So let's get into the area. We've talked about the EEOC, and there is some litigation out there from the EEOC for Title VII violations. But the big area where employers are getting in trouble um, in their screening process is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, the FCRA is a relatively easy law to comply with, but employers, for whatever reason, still seem to be making that mistake of not being really fully compliant. And the plaintiff's lawyers have discovered this law. So let's talk about the FCRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. First of all, it is a horribly named law. It should be called the Fair Consumer Reporting Act. Uh, the idea being that this law deals with consumer reports, not just credit. So ignore the word credit in the title of the law. Uh, and that's going to sometimes be hard for you to, as you're explaining to, especially your executives and things, that the Fair Credit Reporting Act applies to what we're doing here. And, and they're going to say, well, we don't order credit. Well, it's just a bad name for a law. Uh, but when the law was passed in 1970, 71, the only people really doing delivering consumer reports, doing background checks for you know employers or the other things that the FCRA covers were the credit uh, bureaus. And, uh, and their main focus of the, uh, of the law at that time was really that idea of credit reports. But it's really expanded, especially with the changes that were made in 1996. And so we want to just, I want to stress here, that it should be the Fair Consumer Reporting Act. And in the context we're talking about, um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act governs a report from a third party like me, like your background screening partner, um, that details anything about the applicant's credit, but anything about their character, general reputation, personal characteristics, or mode of living. So you can imagine, okay, your employment history, that goes to personal characteristics, reputation, mode of living. Uh, your criminal history, that's character, general reputation, personal characteristics, mode of living. Any of the stuff that you would normally see in a background check would be governed by these things. And so just assume that anytime you're paying for information, whether it's from your background screening company, or from the National Student Clearinghouse, if you're trying to verify a degree, that's a consumer report. Or uh, the work number, you know, the um, you know Equifax owns the work number now, and you know that's a lot of employers use that to verify uh, their former employees' uh, employment details because they don't want to have uh, a staff dedicated to answering those phone calls all day, but. The difference is, is that now that those reports coming through the uh, work number are consumer reports. So everything we're going to talk about today would apply, even if you're not, or, don't think you're ordering background checks and you're ordering the information straight from the work number just to verify somebody's claim that they worked at uh, General Motors for 10 years. That is a consumer report. Though. And so you just need to understand everything we, we're talking about does apply to, to that situation. So certainly we think about all of this applying in the employment context when somebody is uh, applying for work, your applicants, and certainly it does, uh, and that's where most background checks on employees or applicants are run. Uh, in, in the employment context, it's pre-hire as, as, uh, as applicants, but the Fair Credit Reporting Act takes a much broader view of the term employment, and so it includes employment or promotion um, or if you're evaluating somebody for reassignment to another position, or even retention. If, uh, if you're just looking, if you're going to do uh, an annual criminal background check or pull driving records on an annual basis to evaluate uh, your employees, and, and it could affect their retention, their eligibility to work in a certain kind of job. It's going to affect any of the details of their, uh, of their work, uh, of the terms and conditions of their, of their work environment, then certainly that report would, would affect uh, their employment status. And so whatever information you purchase from your background screening partner or a third party that's not the original source of that information uh, would be a consumer report. So you want to make sure that in your policies you're talking about this stuff and, and using the kind of language that makes it clear. Um, now there is a, another kind of a special kind of consumer report called an investigative consumer report. And that, that's a consumer report where information about somebody, uh, about you know, their uh, reputation, mode of living, character, those kinds of things, 
comes from interviews with other people about them. And so, like, when, when my employees walk in the courthouse and do courthouse research, that's, you know, they're not interviewing anybody. They're just looking at the public records. But when we call a former employer on, on behalf of our clients to sit, check uh, somebody's employment history, when we're just verifying the dates of employment, title, uh, salary, things like that, that's, that's not an interview. That's just verifying information. But as soon as we cross over into things like, um, tell me how he got along with his coworkers, or, you know, was there ever any reason to question his integrity or honesty, or did he ever act in a threatening or coercive manner? Those kinds of questions, those become interviews. And so when you when when your background screening partner or your HR consultant or whoever it is is checking employment references for you, that's probably a consumer report. And when they ask those kind of questions, that makes it an investigative consumer report. Now, why do, why do we even care about investigative consumer reports? Well, there's specific language that's got to be on your disclosure and authorization forms that we'll talk, to, talk about in a little bit uh, if, it's a, if it's an investigative consumer report. And the safest thing you can do is just assume that it, it is going to be an investigative consumer report and leave that information uh, in the disclosure document, even if you think you're most of the time only going to order from the industry. So a lot of employers do check references. And, and, you know, sometimes an employer says check their references, and what they really mean is just verify the details of their employment with a former employer, you know, contacting uh, the payroll department or HR and verifying, you know, title and dates of employment and all that stuff. But sometimes what, uh, when somebody says they, they're going to check references, they're actually going to have us, you know, uh, have the background screening company contact a former uh, employee, a supervisor, something like that. If your background screening company contacts that former supervisor and uh, asks for information about that applicant, that's definitely a consumer report. However, when you, as the employer, contact that former supervisor or coworker, that you know, that person who worked with them, and you talk to them about uh, their experience with your applicant, that is not a consumer report. So, if you're getting information directly from the source of the information, um, you know, the person, you know, so you know, the former supervisor or whatever, and you as the employer the, or prospective employer are calling to check that information, that is not a consumer report. So it's only a consumer report when it comes through a third party uh, like Imperative Information Group or your, your, your background screening partner. There's an exception to this idea of a consumer report because sometimes an employer will have to hire an outside party to come in and conduct an investigation of an employee. So that may be a situation such as, you know, you've had a sexual harassment claim against a manager, or uh, maybe there's been some sort of theft or loss in your warehouse, and so you're going to bring in some sort of investigation firm uh, to, to look at what's going on. Um, there was a, an opinion by the Federal Trade Commission in the 1990s that even if a um, if it was an outside person just doing an investigation because you know they, they believed an employee, um, you know, was doing in, engaging in some sort of misconduct, the F Federal Trade Commission said back then that well, in fact, that would be a consumer report because of the way the law was written. Well, they changed the law with a uh, with FACTA in 2002, I guess, and um, and FACTA excludes any kind of in, in, investigations into employee misconduct or um, violation of laws, uh, regulations, or company policy. So if, you're, if you have to hire an outside party, and we do this for clients as well from time to time, uh, come in, you know, if you have to hire an outside party to come in and do an investigation, that is not a consumer report, even though it's information from a third party that you're paying for about the employee. However, uh, there is a requirement that at the end of that investigation, that you have to give a summary of the nature and scope of the investigation to that employee if you're going to take adverse action against them. So a lot of people don't realize, a lot of employers don't realize this. So if you hire, uh, you you know, you hire an outside person, whether it's really, quite honestly, it's your your employment law attorney or your HR consultant or a local investigator or whatever to come in and do an investigation for you, 
uh, at the end of that, you have to give them a summary of the investigation. Now, it, it can be very brief, and we usually write these for our clients, but it would be something along the lines of uh, an allegation of sexual harassment was made against you. Uh, our investigator uh, interviewed uh, a number of people with information about this. Um, and at the end of the investigation, they, they delivered a report to us. Uh, and based on that information, we're taking this adverse action. We're going to, you know, we're going to terminate you or we're going to write you up or whatever. That's as, as far as it goes. To go. So you don't have to name the sources of information and things like that. So uh, you just need to know that that's out there. And like I said, the plaintiff's lawyers are aware of this stuff. And so you're going to see more and more litigation around this. You also should know that the Fair Credit Reporting Act has some restrictions on what employers can be told by their background screening companies. So criminal convictions, guilty, you know, where somebody is found guilty of an offense, uh, those are reportable forever. And that still surprises some employers, uh, but the federal law allows criminal convictions to be reported forever. Now, having said that, there are some states that have laws on the books that restrict the reporting of criminal history information. So um, California is one. So in California, someone can be convicted of murder, and I can't tell my California client about it if that conviction was eight years ago. As annoying as that is for me, I can't do it. So, um, you know, in some states like Texas have uh, laws on the books that, that uh, cover that, but those laws were preempted by federal law. So it just you need to talk to your background screening company because it depends on when that state put that law into place. But generally, under federal law, criminal cases are reportable forever. Then non-conviction criminal cases where somebody, where the case was dismissed or they got deferred adjudication and at the end of the deferred adjudication, the case was dismissed or they were just found not guilty. Um, all those can be reported, but they can only be reported for seven years. Uh, and the same goes for civil cases, liens and judgments, uh, negative employment information. I can't tell an employer I can't tell my client that um, this person was fired for theft from this employer nine years ago. Uh, unless, and, and the caveat to all these seven-year limitations under federal law is if it's, if it's reasonable to believe the, the person in that position would earn $75,000 a year or more, then you can report everything. So, um, so I can tell my clients uh, if, if the guy's making $75,000 a year, I can tell them everything. But if they're making $74,000 a year, I can't tell them things that are older, negative items that aren't criminal convictions that are older than seven years. So um, from time to time, you may get a call from your background screening company, and they'll ask, how much is this person going to make? Well, what's happening is they've got something they think you should probably know about, and uh, but they don't know if they can legally tell you. So we have a process in place where when you're ordering an online report through us, our clients can tell us the person's going to, you know, what the person's uh, anticipated wages are or whether it's, you know, in a lot of our clients just put 75K plus as, as the, you know, potential uh, salary and wages. But the, um, you know, on occasion, if you get that call, that's, that's, that's telling you that, uh, you know, we just need to know how much it is so we know if what all the information we have is reportable. And as I mentioned, Texas and some other states do have restrictions uh, on the books, but some many of those states passed their, their laws after 1996. And the federal law that changed in 96 said that if you have, you know, that a state that has limitations on what can be reported to an employer, um, on the books as of 1996, they get to keep it. But if they pass a law later than that, then they, those laws are preempted. So Texas, you know, did run out and, and change their laws. Some other states did too. Uh, but they were preempted already by the federal law. So, um, and that's generally recognized. I've, I've never seen, you know, I know tons and tons of background checks are done in Texas, and a lot of them contain information older than seven years. And I've never seen any litigation in Texas on any of that. And I'll get a call from time to time from a, uh, usually a criminal defense attorney who says, you know, under the business and commerce code, you can't report this in Texas on my phone app. And I've got a little two-page document that I 
email them and uh, that explains the federal law and the preemption, and then I never hear from them again. So uh, it's pretty well documented that uh, in Texas, a uh, you know we can report that to our clients. Now that doesn't mean the information the person's not employable just because he's got something that owed, and it certainly doesn't mean an employer is going to uh, always find that information relevant because you know depending on what the information is. Uh, we, you know, the conviction, you know, a, ten, a 20 year old conviction for uh, shoplifting is probably not going to be relevant for most positions. But if we see it, we're going to tell our clients about it. You should also, when you're signing up with your background screening company, you should have to certify that you're going to follow the law, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and you're going to do all the things we're going to talk to about here with the disclosure and authorization and the pre adverse action processes. But then also you should certify that you're not going to use any of this information in violation of um, any uh, equal employment opportunity laws. So, um, or, you know, and you're not going to uh, use it, the information for any other purposes other than employment, things like that. So there should be a whole list of certifications you make when you uh, sign up with your new background screening company. And why does all this matter? Because the plaintiff's lawyers, as I mentioned earlier, have discovered this law. And there are a lot of class action lawsuits against employers for this. And you, these are all settlements. The average settlement is about $3.1 million. And so it's enough to, to make you say, yeah, we're going to pay attention to this and uh, make sure that we're doing it right. Now, most of these lawsuits started not because the employer did something extremely wrong, most of these lawsuits started, the first thing that happened was the employer was relying on an inaccurate background check. Uh, because think about it, if the employee gets the job and there's nothing incorrect on the background check, why would they ever go talk to a plaintiff lawyer? But what's happened in almost all of these cases, that all the ones I've looked at so far, um, is that the first um, plaintiff in that class action had information on their report that was incorrect. And this is just the danger of using just cheap background checks, these instant online database driven background checks, um, because they're going to associate records with the wrong people. And if there's no human looking at that and, and verifying information against the court's records, you're going to see records that don't belong to your applicant. And, um, and so, and especially the less, the less sophisticated applicants aren't sure about how to dispute this information and do all of that. And they end up just going, not losing an opportunity for employment and get, they go talk to a lawyer. And the lawyer says, yeah, you have a, you may have a case here, but let's look deeper at everything the employer is doing and see if there's anything we can get them on, any kind of technicality uh, that we can get them on. And uh, we will bring a class action lawsuit against the employer, which means a lot more money for at least for the uh, the plaintiff's attorney and a lot more time and frustration for the employer. And like I said, the, that plaintiff's attorney wouldn't have ever looked at an employer but for the, the, the incorrect background check to start with. And these are companies that are currently facing uh, background check litigation over the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, so the, the lawsuits keep coming. Michaels has a couple of them. I think Uber does too. Um, we've got on our blog uh, uh, an explanation of the Walt Disney litigation, what the allegations there are there. So there's a lot of law lawsuits out there. Is, is, you know, so you want to make sure you're doing all this. So you document all of that process. That's the first big step is having a plan before you ever order your first background check, knowing what you're going to do. But then uh, let's get into the disclosure and authorization process. This is one area that a lot of the, the litigation focuses on. Before you order uh, your, your background check on an applicant, you have to disclose to them, to the, you know, they're, they're called consumers and under the law, you have to disclose to the consumers that you're going to procure a consumer report, a background check, um, and that you're going to do that, um, you know, related to their employment. And you'll see in our sample language here, it says uh, related to your prospective, continued, or future employment. So in most states, not all, but in most states, that, that also complies with state law. So you can run 
the background check at any time during the course of employment. So if you want to do annual background checks on your employees, things like that, if you've got this language in there, you can use this initial disclosure and authorization to uh, run a background check later. So the top of this form is all the disclosures. This is disclosing to them that you're going to obtain a consumer report. And then you'll see that second paragraph there references an investigative consumer report, which, you know, it's your, their way of saying, you know, we may do, during this, we may have, do interviews with people who know stuff about you. And that would be, again, like former supervisors, things like that at employment, in, you know, at previous employers. So we, as soon as you say you're going to go interview people, people have this idea that you're going to go talk to their neighbors and all of that. And it, you could, but that's extremely rare. Uh, only for security clearances or for, or for executive level positions do our clients ever ask for that kind of information. But that's what those are the two disclosure areas, the information about the investigative consumer report and the, uh, you know, and the regular consumer report. But then you also have to get their authorization in, in writing. It can also be electronic if it's uh, compliant with the uh, eSign Act. Um, and you've got to get their authorization to procure the background check, the consumer report, and in writing. So, in that disclosure document, that this information at the top, under the law, has to be on a document used exclusively for the purpose of disclosing to the consumer that you're going to procure the background check and authorizing the uh, the background check. So that disclosure cannot be part of the small print at the back of your employment application. It's got to be a separate document altogether. It cannot be, you can't include other information on that document. So under the law, what, is, what, is, uh, what does document mean? Well, we don't know for sure. So if, if, it, if, you, know, if you send a, a PDF file to the applicant or they download a PDF off your website and then they print it, and that disclosure information is on a separate page all by itself when it's printed out, is that a separate document? Well, the plaintiff's lawyers have alleged that no, it's not a separate document. If, if it's a PDF file, um, that's a single document and which is multiple pages. So what we recommend clients do is if you've got an electronic application of some sort uh, and that you electronically email or you know, allow the applicant just to download as a, you know, usually that's a PDF file, make this disclosure document a separate document just to be safe um, from the rest of the employment application. A lot of uh, your uh, of your ATSs will have this, this disclosure document built into the application process and that's perfectly fine, but it really needs to be a separate screen uh, and they need to acknowledge that they've received that disclosure and you need to capture exactly what it looked like, what what you know, what was on that document that they were that they are that you're capturing that they um, that they're acknowledging what was what did it actually say. So um, it's all perfectly doable, and a lot of of your background screening companies uh, use software just like we do that allows also allows for these disclosures to be provided to applicants through the background screening process, not the application, and so electronically we can communicate the, the online for our clients when they order the background check it will go to the give the consumer an opportunity to do the disclosure and then get the authorization and then move on to uh, providing the information for the rest of the background check and if you have questions please don't hesitate to drop them into the uh, question box at the bottom uh, and I will answer all of those before we, we, we leave today so there's your information about the disclosure document. Uh, one thing that a lot of this litigation is focused on is the fact that employers and often their employment law attorneys are including releases of liability in this disclosure document. And remember I said this disclosure document has to be used exclusively for the purpose of disclosing to the consumer that you're going to procure a background check. So as soon as you start including releases and other stuff like that that's unrelated, to disclosing and authorizing the background check, then you are violating the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and several courts have ruled that that's a violation of the FCRA. So, or if you, I see also at will statements for some reason thrown into this disclosure document, and um, if, and, and I've seen it, you know, done you know by employment law attorneys because the problem with this law is this is not an employment law. This isn't like the Fair Labor Standards Act. This is a consumer reporting law, and um, 
it, it can, it, although it's not very complicated, sometimes um, employment law attorneys don't understand exactly how specific this law is about what's got to be in these documents. And so they started adding things like at will and uh, releases of liability. And then the next thing you know, you've got a non-compliant um, disclosure document. So you don't want that stuff in, in your disclosure document. So go back and look at your disclosure document right now and or as soon as this webinar is over and see if that's right, what you've got in there. Then after the disclosure and authorization has been received by you, you can order the background check from uh, your screening partner. But again, you should have to certify at the time of the, that you're ordering the background check that you have uh, obtained this person's, uh, you haven't followed the requirements for disclosing that you'll, to the consumer that you're going to order the background check and you've received their authorization. They should be part of the, uh, the ordering process. You should be uh, seeing something where they're asking you to certify that you've, already, you've followed the law so far and you will continue to do so. That should be every time you order a background check. So you order the background check and the information comes back from your background screening company. And something on the report gives you pause. You think, well, you know what? Uh, we may not hire this person or we may consider this person for a different position or something like that. Well, that would make it a, uh, an adverse action. And so, you know, obviously with a background check in, in the applicant and employment context, you're thinking of, okay, if, it, if we don't hire them, but there could be other conditions, other situations, maybe this DWI for this outside salesperson gives you concern. And so maybe you're thinking, uh, you know, he's got a great history as a salesperson. I'm just not sure I'm willing to put him behind the wheel of a car representing the company until we get to know him better because this two-year-old DWI gives me some concerns. And so may you offer him an inside sales position. Well, that background check affected that decision. And, and so that he knows that the background check is may affect the decision before you take that take that action, you've got to give them a copy of their report and a copy of their rights under the law. And that summary of rights under the Fair Credit Reporting Act is a three-page document from the uh, Federal Trade Commission and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And it is, uh, quite honestly, it, it reads just like a, government, a document written by a government committee. It's, I think your applicants will almost never read it. But before you take the adverse action, before you certainly before you offer the job to anyone else or before you tell the applicant you're not we're not going to consider you for employment you have to give them a copy of their report and a copy of their rights under the law now you don't have to tell them what on the report is going you know may adversely impact the hiring decision uh, under federal law and in most states you don't have to do that but like in New York City they their new ordinance that goes into effect October 27th will require employers to explain why uh, they, they weren't hired, uh, the applicant wasn't hired based on the background check, what the information about their criminal history was that prevented them from getting the job. So there are some specific things, you know, depending on where you're, you're located. Your background screening company should be able to help you find that stuff as well. And the law doesn't require that you give them any additional information when you order the when you give them a copy of their report and their rights, but of course you want to because first of all it's going to save a bunch of phone calls to HR saying why am I getting this, but also you want to give it to them so that they can they understand what's going on and uh, if if the information is wrong or they want to challenge it, um, you give them a way to do that. Oh, you know you can tell them how to contact the background screening company. And so, we, and while it's not strictly required, um, our built-in process, which will automate all of this for our clients, does have a cover letter that makes it, you know, they explain to the applicant why, they, why they're getting this information. Um, we also tip our hat in our, our adverse action letter to the EEOC's expectation that employers um, give applicants uh, an individualized assessment is what the EEOC calls it. And we'll talk about this a lot more in the EEOC webinars. But basically, the EEOC believes that an employer should give an applicant an opportunity to explain why that applicant's 
that employer's policy regarding that applicant's criminal history should not apply to that applicant. So, you know, and it, he, it, they believe you should give the applicant an opportunity to say, well, you know, I studied, uh, I went back after, after, after I got out of jail, I went back and got my master's degree. Or I took these classes in while I was in prison. Or I completed all my deferred adjudication without having any issues. And uh, my parole, you know, or my uh, community supervision officer, uh, you know, uh, said that I was one of the best people they ever had and whatever. So, you know, and what you often, you know, hear is, well, that really wasn't me or it wasn't fair. Uh, my best one was an applicant once told me, yeah, I did that, but the cop who arrested, it wasn't fair because the cop who arrested me, he's had it in for me since high school and he was just waiting for a chance to arrest me. Well, and so they admit the offense, but just, they just didn't like the fact that the, uh, you know, the cop who, who arrested them uh, was a, a high school rival of some sort. And they thought that that gave them some justification about it. So we build this in there so that right up front on the criminal history inquiry, uh, or I mean on the pre-adverse action letter, um, the applicant, you're giving that applicant an opportunity to tell the whole story. So that's, again, that's not required by the law. That's constable according to coffee stuff, but it, uh, we believe it, it helps our clients uh, demonstrate uh, their compliance with the FCRA or with the EESC's expectations regarding Title VII. So you make this pre-adverse action. Um, before you take the action, you make sure you give them a copy of their rights and copy of their summary of their, uh, a copy of their report and a summary of their rights. Okay. So now it's time to take a breath. Just breathe, relax. Give the applicant an opportunity to look at that information and make sure they've received it, certainly before you take the adverse action. Um, there's several ways you can give that pre-adverse action information to the applicant. You can, um, you can mail it to them. And when you mail it, what we do when, at Imperative when we're mailing it on behalf of our clients is we mail it certified mail. So we get uh, a record of when it was delivered. And so that's one way you can do that. So, and you've got some proof that, you know, you can look it up on the Postal Services website and say, okay, he received it today. And so we'll give him, you know, uh, some time to review it and, and get back with us. And maybe the next day if he's, he's received it, but he hasn't responded back, then you can make a hiring decision. We recommend clients, although it's not required by law, um, if they haven't heard from the applicant, uh, you know, and they, they're not sure when the applicant's going to receive that information, we, rec we recommend the clients wait at least five days um, to make sure it's the mail and everything else has had, had an opportunity to, to get that information to the person. Now, there are other ways to do it besides doing the mail them. Um, like our online report management system, uh, where clients order their reports and all that, also has the opportunity, if you've got the applicant's email, you hit a button and it will email the applicant a, uh, a link to log into our system and review their report and receive their rights online electronically. And then they can print it out or whatever. And so that gets it to them the same day. So you can hit that button, then you can turn around and call the applicant and say, hey, I need you to go check your email because uh, I, I need to talk to you about your, you know, I need you to review your background check. Uh, and they will do that lickety split, um, we found. And so, and the great thing about that is it gives a date and time stamp. And so we know what IP address they access from and all of that. So we know when they looked at it. So that's another way to do it. You can also do it in person. Um, of course, the guy who was convicted of killing the HR manager, you're probably not going to call into the office to talk about his criminal history. But um, you know, if uh, the person's a current employee, for instance, and you're doing a background check on, on all your employees on an annual basis to see if they've got new criminal history and maybe you're concerned because this applicant has a, uh, or this employee has a, uh, a theft conviction in the last year and they handle cash in your organization. Or they've got a DWI and they're a driver. And you say, well, you know, we need to talk about this. And, and so you call the, applicant, the employee into the office, you hand them a copy of their rights and a copy of their report, and you give them a chance right there to sit down and look at it and say, you know, and ask them, is this accurate? And, uh, and hopefully you've got a policy. We've got a whole webinar on this too about what to do when an employee gets arrested. But hopefully you've got a policy that says if an employee is arrested or has a, uh, you know, some sort of interaction with law enforcement that they're supposed to report it to HR. 
and so you can also ask them why they didn't follow the policy. But you can do all that in person too. So you can you can mail it to them, you can do it electronically, or you can do it in person. The most important thing is to make sure before you take the action that you give them an opportunity to see the information. And if they tell you at any point that information is not true, uh, you I would suggest you assume that they're telling you the truth initially. Because um, depending on who you're using for your background checks, it could be true. You may see that some, uh, you know, I've talked to employers who've said as much as you know, 20 or 30 percent of their applicants um, dispute information on their reports and have the reports changed uh, because of the dispute. So it could happen. Now, if you're working with a good screening company, you should probably see maybe one dispute a year, if even that. I mean, if you're working with a really good background screening company, they're going to make sure that the information is getting to you is accurate, but of course that's more expensive than a $20 or $30 background check over the internet. So, you know, um, you can't expect, uh, you know, if you're, if you're buying just a cheap background check, you can expect a high level of accuracy with it. So, um, but whatever you do, you want to make sure you give some time for that applicant to look at it. And if the applicant tells you it's not them, they should dispute it back to the background screening company. So they, they you know, that cover letter that we suggest, you know, includes our contact information and then the applicant can call us and, Tell us what dirty dogs we are about reporting that old criminal conviction that you know they didn't you know mention to the employer on the employment application and all that, or they can say you know this isn't right. This employer said I was I was fired for cause, but uh, they you know when they actually allowed me to uh, resign, so it wasn't I wasn't fired, I wasn't terminated. Uh, it was resignation in lieu of termination. And so they can dispute that. And if they dispute it, the background screening company has 30 days to reinvestigate it. Now, under the law, you don't have to keep that open. for You don't have to hold that position for 30 days for them. But uh, if you're working, again, with a good background screening company, they're going to get that dispute resolved the same day or the next day most of the time. They're going to turn around and go verify that court record, or they're going to go call that employer and say, hey, Joe Smith, you told us last week Joe Smith was terminated for cause, but uh, he's saying, you know, he's disputing that, and he's saying that the information came uh, that, that was wrong, and, and that, in fact, you, 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 he resigned in lieu of termination. And, uh, and then whatever the employer says, the background screening company should report that back to you, and they should either change the report, uh, delete the inc any incorrect information, or just to notify the, app, the consumer, the, the applicant or employee, that, you know what? Uh, we verify this information, it's accurate. So they have 30 days to do that, but a good screening company is going to get that taken care of uh, really quickly. So just take a breath. If you uh, trust your screening company to do a good job, or if they don't do a good job uh, in handling that, find another screening company. But sometimes when the applicant says, it wasn't me, that's not me, I don't know what, that is, what you're talking about, sometimes they are really telling the truth. This is a file right out of our own, our own experience uh, at Imperative. Our client was a large social services organization, well respected in the community. And they went to hire a social worker who was also well respected in the community, served on different boards and was well known. He'd been in the community for you know, his whole career, going back 20 plus years, but when we're doing the background check on the social worker, we find a record with his name, and the guy had a really unique name too, uh, something you know like Ezekiel, Uriah, you know Jehoshaphat. I mean, it's really a unique name that you wouldn't expect another person with that name and date of birth uh, out there. It was unique enough. So um, during the background check, we found these criminal records on him. In, uh, from 1996 in South Carolina and from 2001 and two in here in Texas. But his employment history was consistent. He had been consistently employed during all those times here locally in Fort Worth. So that was a red flag for us. And before we reported this criminal information to our clients, we said, well, you know, we did some research and we couldn't find any evidence that there was another person with that same name and date of birth in the country. And so we ordered copies of the court documents and we ordered these mug shots that you see here. And so the, uh, those came in and, 
we're looking at the court that the, at the documents that came from the court, and we find, well, look, one of them has a social security. They actually both had social security numbers, uh, different social security numbers. One of them had a social security number that had never been issued, and the other one had a social security number that belonged to a woman. And so those are some more red flags that something's not right here. And so then we got these mug shots, and you can see these are actually the same. This is actually the same. Uh, it looks like it was a rough five or six between uh, South Carolina and Texas, but same guy. And you can see there he's right at 70 inches tall. Uh, and so we uh, called our client, and I actually made the call, and I said, so tell me about this guy, this social worker, Ezekiel Uriah Jehoshaphat. And, um, what's, he, what, you know, what's his story? He said, oh, he's amazing. Uh, you know, uh, he's got a... You know, he's well known in the community. He's a great, great social worker. Uh, okay, well, describe him to me. Well, he's he's just a real nice guy. No, I mean physically describe him to me. Well, he's about a a six foot two black guy. Oh, this is not a six foot. These mug shots are not of a six foot two black guy, certainly. So, I uh, I, I thought I figured out what happened. So, I called the the applicant directly and said, Hey, we're doing this research and it, We've come across these records under your name and date of birth, and you seem to be the only person with this unique name and date of birth. But we're finding all these records for for you, but they, you know, with somebody else's picture and all of that. And and the guy had no idea this was out there, but he said it made a lot of sense because whenever he got a traffic ticket, for instance, it took forever. They processed uh, the uh, it took forever to process the traffic ticket. He'd he'd be sitting in his car while the the police officer was in, and, in, in, you know, would go back to the computer in, in their car, and they'd be there for quite a while. It really helped that, I guess, that, this, you know, our applicant was, was a black guy, and this is a white, you know, clearly a white guy. And so, you know, and I was talking to the applicant, he had no idea, but it started, things started clicking, and he said, you know, back in the 90s, when he was in the military, uh, early 90s, and when he was in the military, his, um, his identity had been stolen. Somebody had opened bank accounts in his name and it, and some credit cards, and it had been a real mess to get cleaned up, but he thought it was all resolved years ago. Well, for whatever reason, this guy, whoever stole his ID, when they got arrested for whatever, you know, domestic violence or whatever, or DWI or whatever it was, they used, they probably had some fake ID that had, had his name and date of birth on it. And that's how they got prosecuted. And so now this guy in the photos, fingerprints are associated with our applicant's name and date of birth. And so you can imagine what a, what a nightmare that would be to clean up, but it could have been a lot worse for him. I've heard stories where identity theft and criminal records has led to the wrong person getting thrown in jail overnight and things like that. So, uh, so all that to say that when your applicant says it's not me, sometimes they're telling the truth. And, and give them a chance to dispute the information. But once, uh, if they don't dispute the information, or once your screening company comes back to you and tells you, you know what, this is really, this information is accurate, you can go ahead and take the adverse action. And uh, there's specific things that have to be in your notice for adverse action, and it's very similar to what we put in the actual letter, uh, the pre-adverse action letter, but uh, you've got to tell them that we're going to take uh, this action. You've got to describe what the action is. In this sample here, it's to rescind the previous offer for, of employment. Then you have to explain that the decision was based in whole or part on the information provided uh, in the consumer report and that the consumer report was prepared by whoever your screening partner is or the National Student Clearinghouse or whatever it was and uh, pointing out that you know, they here's how you can contact them. And that the screening company, the consumer reporting agency is what they're called under the law, uh, doesn't make the hiring decision. Uh, that's, that's required by the law that you put that in there. And so you can imagine my industry uh, back in when that was when that that law was written, uh, you know, they didn't want the consumers assuming that they were making a hiring decision. So they got that in there. And it also has to give them information about how to get a copy of their report for free from the consumer reporting agency, even though you've already provided one to them previously. So 
Uh, that's all got to be in that adverse action letter. And again, you can do that in person, you can deliver that to the applicant in person, or you can do it electronically if you've got a system to do it that way, or you can do it via mail. So, you know, none of this is really complex. These, you know, this Fair Credit Reporting Act stuff is is not that difficult, but it has led to a lot of litigation. So now let's go to questions. I hope I hope it's been helpful, and I hope you've uh, you can take this information. We will be emailing out uh, probably tomorrow the uh, um, a copy of the uh, slides, and each of the slides has more notes on it than what uh, what you saw on the screen. So uh, many of my talking points are right there. So I would suggest that. Uh, you know, you'll get those tomorrow, and you'll also uh, get a link to. Uh, actually, what you'll get tomorrow is a link to take a survey to tell me how I did, uh, what you thought of the webinar, and if it was helpful. And then at the end of the survey, you'll get a link to download the uh, slides uh, and notes, and you'll get the HRCI and SHRM uh, recertification information. Uh, so look for that. Hopefully, in the mail. Uh, in the email in your email later this afternoon or tomorrow if you don't have it by tomorrow afternoon check your spam filter and then shoot me an email if you don't get it because sometimes uh, it, it gets lost um, between your uh, our, our email server and yours uh, and but I'm not seeing any questions so I'm assuming that we've I've answered all of your questions but feel free to shoot me an email if you do have questions um, I would be glad to answer uh, anything if you know sometimes it's, it's easier after the after the webinar to think about it if you want me to look at your disclosure documents or anything like that feel free to email those over to me I'm always glad to take a look and, and give you some uh, a little bit of free consulting and have you look at you know if I could help I, I'm, I'm always glad to I want to thank everybody for taking the time to be with us today and I hope you if you found this helpful I hope you'll look at our website and see the other things that we have coming up they're all free, they're all approved for credit, and hopefully they'll help you improve your hiring and selection process. Until then, I'm Mike Coffey, President of Imperative Information Group, and I appreciate you spending the time with us. If I can ever be of service to you uh, in, in helping your company improve your background screening process, I would, uh, I'd love to talk to you about what you're doing and how, and how Imperative might be able to help. Thanks a lot. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.